Benchmark, the voice of business. Presented by LMD. On this edition of Benchmark, the governor of the central bank, Nivad Cabral, is in the hot seat today for part one of an exclusive two-part interview. Then, LMD columnist and market analyst Hasda Premaratna discusses market trends. And finally, Kiran Echen, country manager of TNS Lanka, comments on the findings of the island-wide survey on the energy sector. That's the lineup for Benchmark. Hello and welcome to the Big Picture Business Program, Benchmark. I'm Savitri Rodrigo. If ever there was a hot button topic in Sri Lanka, it's the state of the economy. Everyone has an opinion and it depends, depending on who you're actually listening to, it's either on the brink of collapse or we have nothing to worry about. So to give us a clearer picture, we invited to our program the Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, Nivad Khabral. Welcome, Governor, and thank you very much for joining us to share your views on Benchmark. Now, when you look at the big picture assessment of the Sri Lankan economy, what do you see? Well, I think uh, it's a good thing that you're asking me that because we always look at the big picture. And when you look at the big picture, you see the uh, growth trends, which is very strong. It could have been stronger had the global conditions being a little more benign. But even with the current conditions, we can see there is a strong momentum being created. At the same time, we are seeing our macro fundamentals, which are also staying benign, even in a very rough uh, environment. As you know, inflation is under control. We have seen the banking sector under uh, some serious uh, stresses worldwide, but we have been able to maintain it in a very stable environment. We are also seeing the unemployment rates down. We are seeing uh, the debt levels at reasonable uh, levels. At the same time, we also see that um, the global conditions are such that there can be some element of uh, tension in our exports uh, that uh, we need to address. But the good news is that we have been able to anticipate many of those conditions and we have taken the necessary steps to move our economy to a new plane. If you know, in the last three to four years, we have been articulating this uh, change where we have uh, made it a little broader, where we have um, ensured that the external account has other sources of uh, incomes coming in, inflows. At the same time, the economy itself is diversifying with the five hub concept and tourism. So all these are uh, reactions as well as proactive measures that we have taken to deal with the conditions. So I would say that uh, we have an interesting period ahead, exciting period in that sense. And if we can maintain our macro fundamentals at the levels that we are having at present, we can enjoy a good sustainable growth. And at the same time, we can also enjoy that per capita incomes rising to the levels that we have um, projected. So are we to assume that the economy is on track and that the opposition claims uh, that it is on the brink of collapse need not be taken too seriously and that is just a uh, source of political uh, gamesmanship? Well, you've got to understand that every six months or so that the opposition has been saying this. If you go back to your benchmark interviews, perhaps, you will find that this is not a new call of the opposition. Very regularly, they have been coming up and saying, in the next three months, the economy is going to collapse, the government is not going to have money, the uh, joblessness is going to increase to uh, unprecedented levels, inflation is going to be like in Zimbabwe, and many, many claims of that nature. So I think we need to take all that with a huge bag of salt because that's the opposition's role. I guess uh, uh, I, cannot, I don't want to blame them. They are attempting to ensure that the uh, forward march of the economy is not uh, going to be uh, that easy. But if you look at the last seven years, we have uh, in fact uh, set it out in our uh, roadmap and we articulated that in many press releases that we have had. Uh, we have shown very clearly as to how the economy has moved so much in the last seven years to a new plane. We had actually a per capita income of less than $1,000 just about uh, 10 years ago. So has the opposition forgotten that? Have they ever experienced 8% plus growth? 
the last three years, even in the worst of times in the world, we have been able to have an overall growth of around 7.5%. So these are all very clear factors which are on the ground for everybody to see. Inflation for 52 months at single digit levels. So I'm not saying this in a sort of a, a boastful manner, but these are the facts on the ground. So looking at all these facts on the ground, if somebody still says that the economy is going to collapse, well, I think they are entitled to their opinion, but I would think that many people won't believe that. But if I'm right, uh, Governor, the President is on record saying that the electricity tariff hikes were necessary to save the economy from collapse. Was he misquoted? And if so, why didn't he write it? Let me tell you, you see, if anyone, take your own channel, if it is going to be selling its products or its services at lower than cost, can you survive? You cannot. Electricity board is just the same. If you, if you buy electricity at 17 rupees average cost and you're selling electricity at 14 rupees average cost, that's not a viable proposition. So it has to be adjusted in order to ensure that the institution itself is going to be viable. That's what the president meant. If it doesn't happen that way, the government will have to pump money into the electricity board, which is not, I think, what everybody wants to have. Everybody says, run these institutions like as if they are commercial establishments. So on one hand, people say run it as a commercial establishment, and on the other hand, they want it at lower, lower, lower than cost. So I think we need to get these um, matters in perspective. I'm glad that you asked that question, because the fact that there has been electricity tariff revision is not in any way the grounds to say that the economy is in collapse. It is a legitimate increase in tariff which needs to take place because of the increase in the costs. And the, any institution has to run a viable institution. So that's where it is. So I don't think there is any connection to the economy uh, collapsing, <laughs> as somebody has made it out to be. And the president, uh, most probably in that case, has been misquoted. Because what the president has said is, you cannot carry these institutions on a regular loss process uh, and then it will be a burden to the economy and then that is going to be difficult for the economy. Business confidence continues to wane and lately corporates are expressing, expressing concern about the high taxes, inflation, the economy, bribery and corruption, the political culture, you name it, it's all there. How do you view this? Look at the facts on the ground. Are the investments coming or not? If you go around the gold road, you can see the number of projects that are taking place. Now are these all on hold? You can see, now when you came to my office to, for this interview, just see the number of cranes that you would have passed when you came from your office to my office. Are these not projects that are taking place? Are these not investments? These are all investments. If you look at all the companies, they are all reinvesting. So I think here again, these are the stories that people say, uh, which has no real uh, basis on the ground. People are investing. We can see the bank credit growth, uh, which is taking place. We have seen new issues of bonds, about 20 billion already this year. Now, these are not signs of a contracting economy. These are signs of people going about, people doing business. So I think uh, we also got to, again, look at these uh, uh, concerns that have been expressed by certain quarters with the right perspective. And if you look at it that way and you see what is taking place in the country, you see the growth last quarter in, in one of the worst times in the world where other countries were growing at half a percent or quarter percent or going backwards. We have recorded a six percent growth. So these are signs not of an economy that is going backwards or stagnant but of a robust economy which is going forward. So what is your outlook for the Sri Lankan rupee going forward? You see we have had a policy where we would allow a flexibility to the Sri Lankan rupee. But at the same time, we have also articulated the policy to say that we will consider not only the imports and the exports, not only importers and exporters, but also borrowers, lenders, people who do business in our, in our country, people who make remittances. All those are stakeholders in the economy. And all of them have a view on the rupee. So we also would be taking an overall view, which takes into consideration the local factors and also the international factors. 
when you look at the international factors, today you can see there is a huge volatility in the exchange rates. The Japanese yen, which was at 75 to 76 yen for a dollar, shot up within a period of about 3 to 4 months right up to 104. Today it is back at 96, then again it has gone up to uh, 100. Look at the fluctuation. The Indian rupee touched 61.50 for a dollar just a few days ago and it's fluctuating around there. So at one time it was 40 odd. So you can see there's a huge volatility. We all do business with these countries. So we are also grappling with that. Naturally there will be a struggle to see how best we can uh, position it uh, and uh, ensure that it has that retention of value. So that's a challenge we have. But I can, I can, you can see that we have been able to manage that in a way that people still have a greater ability to business. The volatility in the Sri Lankan rupee has not been that great. So it's a challenge, but I think the challenge has been met well. We pause for some commercials now. On the other side, the Governor of the Central Bank adds his views on issues pertaining to the economy and its prospects. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. Welcome back to Benchmark. We now continue with our exclusive interview we had with the Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, Nivad Khabra. Now recently, Central Bank relaxed foreign exchange for travel, migration, for uh, buying of non-residential, uh, sale of non-residential, for residential property for non-residents and also maintaining foreign exchange accounts. What was the reason for this? You see, when you have the strength to respond to any fluctuation, you can take more decisions which are on the relaxed mode than otherwise. We have been on a policy where we have requested people to bring in their foreign currency and do business here. And we want to make sure that that is made as easy as possible. Now what we got to understand is people will bring in money when they know that they can take it out as well. If your entry, uh, if your exit is assured, you will enter. That is the philosophy. If your exit is questionable or there is a possibility that you may not be able to exit, you will not enter. So in the foreign currency also it is the same uh, philosophy. We have told people, we have told Sri Lankans, we have told foreigners, look you can do business in this country. You bring in your money, do business and if you want to take it out, you can take it out. Can you give an assurance, can you confirm that these changes will not be reversed in the medium term? You see, what is the assurance that you have for anything for that matter? You see, what you have to understand is, look at the philosophy. What is the way that we have done business? Has there been instances where we have removed these relaxations? Or has it been a constant one-way street where we have relaxed more and more? So, these are the nuances and the signals that people have to pick up. What has been our policy stance? Our policy stance has been extremely clear. If you look at the last seven years, we have relaxed every stage and we are not in any way restricted. Governor, will inflation let up in the months ahead or will we be burdened with the ongoing cost of living spiral? Actually, we don't have a spiral of that nature. We have been able to have uh, inflation, uh, the CCPI movement has been benign. We have had it uh, within the 
single digits for the past 52 months. And we do not see a risk of that increasing to any double digit levels this year. In fact, it will moderate uh, towards the next few months as well. And although there is a slight risk that there can be a movement upwards uh, towards the latter part of the year, uh, we believe that we will be comfortably within the single digits and uh, perhaps even within the mid single digits. So I think um, we have got that situation under control and we have built up space within our policy framework also to deal with any kind of movement uh, if that happens. So I think uh, we have got it under control, but as you know, we have to deal with uh, global situations also which are sometimes completely beyond our control. But Governor, we can't deny that cost of living is high. So will the present rate of inflation be bearable for people who are earning less than the average wage? You see, what we track is not the cost of living by itself. We also tr we track the rate at which the expenses or the basket of expenses is moving. And in that sense, we have had it under control for the last 52 months, as I said. So that also means that people are able to plan out their activities without any undue uh, risk being taken because it is a fairly stable atmosphere that they have. But I think um, sometimes we make a big story out of the uh, items that go up in price. Every time it goes up in price. If you take coconut, at a time when coconut prices go up, they talk about it. But when it comes down, nobody talks about it. So cost of living is really tracked by the Department of Census and Statistics by looking at 373 items which are consumed by the people, the Colombo consumer. When you take all those items into consideration, there will always be some which will go up. And there will be some that will go down, some which stay stable. That's how you track the cost of living index. And from the demand side, we control the demand side inflation by ensuring that the money supply is also in predetermined levels that we have decided to have in line with our growth as well as in line with the um, activities that are taking place in the economy. And that's comfortably within the range that we have uh, wanted it to be. So that's why we are more optimistic that our uh, CCPI or the, our inflation numbers will not get out of hand in the near future. Thank you very much, Governor. So we will be hearing from the Governor of the Central Bank and seeing him on Benchmark in the next program. But meanwhile, on the other side, we have LMD columnist and market analyst Hasta Premaratna, who will give you an update on the Colombo boss and Kiran HN, country manager of TNS Lanka after that. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. Hello and welcome back to Benchmark. I'm Anushan Salvaraj and with me now is market analyst and LMB columnist Hasta Premaratna with the latest on the post. Now, uh, Hasta, the market appears to have achieved a degree of stability. Now, uh, what? how has this been achieved? Yeah, I think uh, as we expected, the market uh, has gone through a, somewhat a correction from uh, about 6,500 levels back to about 6,000 levels. So there have been a, a, a kind of a, a continuous but a sharp correction over the last uh, two to three weeks after the previous rally which took the index from about 5,500 range to about 6,500 which I thought was a little too much and, and, and it had corrected to a level of about 6,000 and seemed to have uh, uh, stabilized there and obviously the, the two 
uh, to three key factors that drove the market to the 6,500 level in that rally. One was the John Keel's share per se, which ran to 300 uh, uh, rupees per share, which has corrected back to the 250 levels. Um, and, and the second uh, reason, obviously, was the fact that there was a, a rate reduction that uh, came in, and uh, there appeared to be uh, a stabilization among the uh, investors on what level of uh, rate reduction and how it can impact the overall market. The fiscal gap is widening, Hasta, and at an alarming rate. Now, how would this affect the market and business in general? Yeah, if you look at the uh, widening fiscal deficit in the first half, if it keep continuing to the second half of the calendar year 2013, uh, obviously uh, the, the government might be under pressure to control the uh, expenditure or the capital investment. So if the capital investments are controlled or reduced, that can uh, have adverse impact on the economic growth, which in turn will have adverse impact on the uh, growth in corporate earnings. So that will have a negative impact on the market. Uh, secondly, if you look at it from a, from a fiscal deficit point of view, if the government decides to go ahead uh, with the spending and the investments as it is uh, while the revenue is uh, not uh, being achieved at the same pace as expected, uh, then obviously the deficit will get widened and the government will have to find alternative ways uh, to fund this uh, widening deficit. Now, at that, at that point, the, uh, if the rupee borrowings, uh, the domestic borrowings are being used as a way in ways and means to finance the deficit, uh, that can put pressure on uh, interest rates. So interest rates may show signs of increasing towards the latter part of the year if that is the case. So that again is not a good thing because from a market point of view, a rising interest rates will have adverse impact. Uh, one, uh, on if the rates go up, the interest costs will go up and as a result the company's uh, profitabilities will come down. So corporate earnings will obviously have a negative impact. On the other hand, the people who have uh, who invest borrowed money will also uh, attempt to pull that back or reduce that uh, amount of uh, uh, investments using borrowed money uh, when the rates go up. So we've seen some kind of uh, rate reduction and some stabilization in, in the market uh, uh, from investors' point of view, but that trend, uh, if it uh, shows signs of uh, changing, that will obviously bring a negative sentiment to the overall market uh, situation. So either way, uh, having uh, a widening fiscal deficit continuing uh, is, is a negative uh, situation to uh, the Market. Let's move on to the exchange rate, Hasta. It just touched 131 to the dollar, which is its lowest that it's been for a while. Now, how would this affect the market considering the market just achieved uh, some sort of stability? Yeah, from a from a trading and a technical point of view, I think uh, what is important to look at is the foreign investors' mindset because if you really look at how this rupee depreciation happened this time around, it's more, more to do with external factors outside in the world than more internal factors within the country because uh, uh, the quantities is easy, easy program in the US uh, is uh, gradually, they're, sh they're showing signs of gradually pulling that back. So as a result, uh, dollar has got strengthened in the global market. So naturally, the Sri Lankan rupee also uh, did suffer, particularly because some of the bond investors in Sri Lanka wanted to turn things back and there were a few, uh, uh, you know, conversions happening in the in the forex market. So I, I think if you look at it that way, uh, from, a, from an investor's point of view, um, having a, a stable currency is always good. Uh, and and uh, a depreciation that comes with the entire world is not that bad. So, I mean, that, that, that's part and parcel of the game. But if it was something that is unique to us and a problem that we had, then, then it would have had a negative impact. So I think from a confidence and a sentiment point of view uh, towards the country's interest, uh, the, the foreign investor will not have a negative impact in this situation. But having said that, I think what everybody will be looking at is, has the rupee corrected adequately? Has it uh, uh, been in a, in, a, in a situation of uh, depreciation uh, as per the fundamentals? So that, that's, that's something that needs to be looked at because anyone who is looking at bringing money in dollars to the market today, to, to Sri Lankan market, naturally would want to see some stability in the rupee because if they feel that there is a chance of further depreciation in the rupee, they may want to hold it back. Uh, because their uh, value of the money in dollar terms will actually come down in the event of uh, rupee depreciating. That was market analyst and LMD columnist Hasta Premaratna with the latest on the bourse. After a short commercial break, Kiran Etchen, the country manager of TNS Lanka, will take us through the results of the latest LMD TNS survey. Stay tuned. When we entered the industry in 1995, 
a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. Hello and welcome back to Benchmark. I'm Anushan Selvaraj and with me now is the country manager of TNS Lanka, Kiran Etchen, with the latest results of the LMB TNS survey. Now, uh, Kiran, the electricity uh, rate hike seems to have further aggravated concerns over the cost of living. Now, what do poll respondents have to say about this? Um, Anushan, you don't need a, a survey to answer this question. Um, I think all the hue and cry in recent times has clearly indicated how uh, the recent rate hikes have just not got on well with people. Um, the government's response to this has been that it was indeed a necessity and, uh, and it was a dire need for them to have done this hike. So we asked our uh, survey respondents um, you know, whether they too thought that this was a necessity. Unfortunately, 82% of uh, the respondents we met believed that this was not a necessity and this was a burden which should not have been passed on to people. Um, uh, while this seems like an overwhelming majority, there's some learning amongst the, the minority 18% who believe that perhaps this was necessary. The, uh, the response is very interesting where they, uh, they mention two things. First is um, uh, um, they believe that uh, the, the, the timing was absolutely wrong. Uh, in the larger backdrop of you know cost of living, increasing prices, income not matching up to that, uh, you know, uh, people were already reeling under that, and this came at a very bad time. Secondly, people also believe that um, uh, you know th the way the government went about it was perhaps wrong. They should have possibly taken the public into confidence, and, um, you know, possibly been transparent about why this was necessary, and then uh, brought about the hike, uh, which might have gone down better. If that is the case, Kiran, who is to blame for this current predicament? Um, when we asked our uh, respondents about it, um, over 74% plus um, of uh, our respondents believe that uh, mismanagement and corruption at the CEB uh, has led to a lot of uh, uh, this, has, had, has led to the hike. Um, but if you ask me, uh, personally, I think this is what you call in research as generic um, you know, uh, mentions uh, uh, because the people are not talking about anything specific. Yes, you do find aspects about how uh, you know, subsidizing could have been done better or e efficiency or wastages could have been curbed. Um, but broadly, it is about the theme of, uh, yeah, it's not being managed well, uh, there is corruption around rather than anything specific. Kiran, what do respondents say is the root cause of the financial woes affecting the CEB? Um, uh, I mean, several mentions, um, and I'm not sure whether the public opinion, uh, you know, uh, can be held against, you know, the financial difficulties. But when we did ask them with a set of aided responses, um, the topmost mention goes to um, uh, electricity wastages and how perhaps we can do a better job of uh, curbing this wastage. People believe that there is a lot of, um, uh, it's weighing heavily on CEB that we are not managing wastage as well. The second big mention is around, uh, I, I mentioned this earlier about mismanagement um, and how we can do better in terms of managing our role or um, efficiencies. So, and under this, there are also mentions about how may, perhaps CEB is overstaffed and uh, that could also be adding to uh, inefficiencies. Uh, the third big mention or the theme, um, uh, what people are talking about, um, uh, is again um, the mechanism of subsidizing uh, and how I think it needs to be done in a better way or perhaps it should be spread across all stakeholders equally. Uh, there is also mention about um, how, uh, you know, uh, electricity is given free for government functions, um, you know, it's free for politicians. Uh, so there are mentions about that and uh, people wonder whether if only there was a cost attached to that, how much CB would be earning. 
That was the country manager for TNS Lanka, Kieran Etchen. Thank you for watching Benchmark, the big picture business program, and we hope to see you again next time.